So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, Postgres, kind of what's coming up in particular in uh, V12, which is the next major release of Postgres that's happening. Um, that'll be coming uh, this fall. Uh, we're actually coming up pretty close on feature freeze for it, so we've got a pretty good list of features that are already uh, committed that will be included or very likely to be included in that release. Uh, a little bit about me, as mentioned, uh, I'm a major contributor to Postgres. I'm also uh, on the committers team. I run the Postgres infrastructure, so if you see an issue with pg.org, you can call me. Um, I also worked on row-level security in 9.5, uh, Kava privileges in 8.4. Um, kind of my really big claim to fame, I guess, is I implemented the role system in 8.3, which was pretty nice. Uh, I've hacked on other things, PLPGSQL, PostGIS, uh, SendMail, uh, I have code in the Linux kernel, um, so it's good stuff. All right, what features are we going to talk about? So I'm going to cover the, these are kind of the topics that we'll talk about. Pluggable storage is a, is a really big one. I'm going to talk a fair bit about that one because it's really important. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our partitioning improvements, performance improvements, uh, some uh, new SQL features that we've got, and some nice things that have changed around system administration, somewhat nice, somewhat not nice, and some, depending on your point of view, I suppose. All right, so let's talk a little bit about pluggable storage. Um, so what's going into V12 right now has been primarily just back-end internal changes. This is uh, some re-architecting and refactoring of the way Postgres accesses it, its storage. Um, it's going to provide for a basis for what's called uh, Z-heap or Z-heap, um, which is not going to be included in V12, but might be included in a future version. Uh, this is an alternative storage architecture to uh, Postgres's traditional heap-based format. Uh, traditionally in Postgres, you have MVCC, and then we have only uh, what typical database people would consider to be a, a redo log, right? Which is that we have a write-ahead log, and in the event of a crash, we can go to the right, last checkpoint in the write-ahead log and play forward, right? Um, some other database systems have things like an undo log, right, which allows you to go backwards. Um, and this is something that is uh, not something Postgres has supported because of the way we do our MVCC is every update is actually an insert and a delete. Well, part of the re-architecture of the storage layer in Postgres is to allow for an alternative heap format which would have a uh, redo log and an undo log for it, right? Because in some cases that's nicer, right, for certain query patterns and for certain update patterns uh, than the MVCC model uh, that where you have inserts and deletes uh, or where updates are entered and deletes uh, that we have today. So that's a, a pretty massive change. The other really big change around pluggable storage that we've been talking um, to a lot of people about is the, that we want to be able to support columnar storage. So if you were here for the last talk, you heard that um, you know, people go out of their way to get columnar-like storage on Postgres using different techniques, uh, a foreign data wrapper um, to some kind of external file base is one way of doing it. Um, there are other techniques like using arrays in Postgres, which allow you to pack data much more tightly um, because you end up, uh, you can get away from having that uh, per tuple overhead, which ends up being the, the big problem, the driving issue when it comes to uh, column uh, type tables in Postgres, right? Where column type tables would be very narrow tables, right? One column or two column tables. So these are pretty massive changes to Postgres, um, and this beginning work has, a lot of it's made it into V12 uh, of this re-architecture. Uh, I think there's probably going to be more of it going into, v into uh, V12. I know that there's some outstanding commits out uh, right now from uh, Andres Freund in particular, who's been uh, kind of the driving force behind pluggable storage. But we're not going to have anything really user-facing in V12 here. This is all kind of part of a multi-year plan to, to get Postgres to a point where we can do pluggable storage, um, as well as support for, for Zheap. We've been making a lot of improvements to our partitioning. Um, so Postgres has declarative partitioning today, um, and over you know a, a number of releases, we've been improving on it. Um, so one of the big things that is going into V12 is much faster planning when there are a lot of partitions involved. Uh, this is a big, big change from Postgres is, uh, kind of inheritance-based planning system that we've been using for a long, long time um, because 
we've kind of gone away from inheritance based because it is inherently expensive to plan with over to a declarative style. But the initial versions of the declarative partitioning in Postgres still use the inheritance type of planner, right? Because it was easier to, to get things working that way. But it meant that we were still limited in, you know, we couldn't have more than a few hundred partitions before query planning started to really suck. Um, so a lot of work's been going into V12 to, to fix that, essentially, right? To make that better. Um, to make it so that you can have thousands of partitions and things will still be performant um, and, and possibly even more. Um, and that allows you to have uh, much more flexibility in how you do your data management with Postgres. Uh, because that's where partitioning is really key is, is for data management purposes. Uh, another thing that's relevant for partitioning in particular is that um, there's this multi-insert option uh, inside of the back end where basically you can insert multiple rows at a time. Uh, that was disabled for partitioning uh, initially simply because it was complicated to make sure we got it right in the event that like a tuple needed to go to a different partition than whatever one we're currently working with. Uh, that's been fixed. Uh, that change will go into V12. What this means is that the ingest, right, the ingest of pulling rows, you know, if you're doing a copy into a partition table, Postgres is going to be much more performant on, uh, at doing that in V12 than we were in earlier versions, which is really, really fantastic. There's also a, a new function called PG Partition Tree, um, which is really cute and really handy to display the entire partition tree. Um, so you pass in a, a parent partition and it'll give you the, the whole tree down, because of course Postgres has multi-level partitioning. Right, you can have multiple levels of partitioning um, off of different even columns uh, at different levels. Um, so that's something that we now have, which is really, really nice. Uh, we have much faster float handling. So this is an interesting one. So there was actually a new library um, that was put out there that allows you to do floating point much faster. Right, This is converting from a floating point value into text. And in fact, it's actually even more accurate um, than we were previously. Uh, so this is going to be a, a really significant speed up for a lot of different workloads, particularly like analytical workloads, things where you're doing a lot of exporting of data with lots and lots of floating point numbers. That's going to become <coughs> much faster in, uh, in Postgres v12. Uh, it, it does also mean that it's possible you might see differences um, if you're actually doing equality comparisons with floating point, um, you're probably doing it wrong. So let's, you know, just be aware of that. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully most of the people here know that, but it is a really, uh, a really impressive in, uh, improvement in the performance and throughput uh, when exporting data out of Postgres that has a lot of floating point in it. So this is one that I'm hoping, I'm not sure if he's actually committed it yet, but we've had a lot of discussion about it, uh, which is, the ability to have serializable with parallel query. Um, so it was previously unsupported. Um, serializable is the, the highest uh, isolation level Postgres supports, and it's also what we call truly uh, serializable, which is a, tends to be a step above what a lot of other database systems provide, um, in that we actually track reads versus writes and look for uh, what are called dangerous edges, right, or dangerous transitions inside the database system. Um, doing all of that correctly when parallel query is involved is a little bit complicated, um, but that's something that's being worked on. Uh, and the really nice thing about using these higher uh, isolation levels is that it means you have to worry less about concurrency, right? The application developers don't have to write as much code to deal with potential concurrency uh, between different transactions that are running against the database system. So this is something to, to be on the lookout for if you've been using serializable as an isolation mode and, and you haven't been getting parallel query, well, hopefully we've, we've now solved that in, uh, in V12. Um, another thing that I didn't put on here that I think is actually, uh, that's related to serializable that's important is the ability to have serializability on replicas. Uh, that's not something that we were supporting. I know that that's something Thomas Monroe was working on. I don't know yet whether it's going to make it into V12. I kind of hope it does, because that would be really awesome. Um, but if you're looking at serializable as your isolation level, you're doing that already. Uh, be looking at V12 to improve uh, things in a number of ways uh, for those kinds of workloads. 
We also have this cool thing called copy from with a where clause. So it used to be that if you wanted to like import a whole bunch of data into Postgres and you wanted to, to filter it out so you didn't actually get like all of that data coming in, you only wanted a subset, you could do something like use the file SDW or you could you know, import it into a temp table and then filter it, um, things like that. Well, now we actually have an ability where you could pass in a where clause to a copy statement and filter that data on the way in so that it's just a, a much simpler alternative to things like um, file FCW, which is still really handy and really nice, like if you want to do joins and other things against that file. Um, but, uh, but if you're just doing filtering, then you can use copy from with where instead now. Inline CTEs. So this is a really big change, right? So uh, those guys supported um, common table expressions for 10 plus years. Um, but they were always done as a materialization step. So we would essentially run the query, materialize the results, and then use those results for whatever subsequent parts of the query that you're doing. Um, what this meant was that if you had a, uh, on the outside of your query, like in the main part of your query, you had some kind of filtering expression, right? And that filtering expression threw away like 90% of the rows from the CTE, we would still go generate all of those rows, right? And we wouldn't actually filter them out until we got to the main part of the query. Um, and in some cases, that, that sucks, right? That's bad. I've had to give many a talk where I've told people, don't, you, don't return lots of rows out of your CTEs because Postgres will materialize them, especially if you're gonna throw them away. Uh, instead, push those down into the CTE or use subqueries or, or something else so you can do that filtering early on. V12 is going to give you the option to do it either way, right? So, and the default is changing. So, starting in V12, we will not always materialize it, right? There may be cases where we still will materialize a CTE um, for various reasons, basically because we have to typically. Um, but if you if you uh, are running a CTE on, on V11 and you run it on V12, you may see a difference in what the query plan ends up being because we're gonna you know, try to inline that CTE unless you actually explicitly say with materialized. So that's the way to get the old behavior back is to say with materialized and then we'll, we'll, it'll be exactly like it was in V11 and earlier. One of the nice things about this is that there's actually you know, people who have done analysis about uh, the Postgres query planner versus the query planner in other database systems. And the fact that we didn't inline CTEs when it made sense to has been pointed out for many years as being a weakness of the Postgres optimizer and that's getting fixed, right? Which is fantastic. So um, this is a, a pretty big step in terms of Postgres's comparison to uh, things like Oracle and, and SQL Server and, and other um, relational databases. Um, it's not so much of a comparison against other databases that only just got CTEs. So let's just, <laughs> that's, you know, and they don't support hash join, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, another really big thing that has happened is we have gotten rid of the recovery.conf file. So if you've ever set up any kind of high availability solution uh, with Postgres using the Postgres replication protocol, you've played with a recovery.conf file or, or some tool that you're using underneath of what you're doing has, has had to go create this file for you. Uh, it's now gone away. We have, we have gotten rid of it. It is no more. Um, what we've done is we've basically merged all of what was in recovery.conf into the PostgreSQL.conf file which means that you can use things like alter system to make changes to the recovery parameters. Um, it uh, increases the flexibility a lot of Postgres with this, but it's gonna be a pretty disruptive change to anyone who's doing high availability or doing regular um, like recovery scenarios, right? So if you back up our server and then recover it onto another server, that, that process is likely to have to change unless you're using a tool like PG Backrest or something that kind of hides that stuff under the covers for you. 
Um, I do think that this is going to kind of reduce the overall fragility of, of HA solutions moving forward. Um, and it also did things like allow us to have a, a SQL level command called PG promote, which is a function that you can call on a replica and have Postgres just get promoted. Right? Um, and the other thing that this allows that I probably should have put on the slide is that uh, this will allow you to, on the fly, on a Postgres replica, change which primary it's pointing to to get its replication stream, which is a pretty massive change. Um, it was previous that you had to actually restart Postgres on the replica to get it to start following a new primary. Uh, that's gone away now uh, with this change. Now that the recovery.conf file is gone, that, that change can be made on the fly, which is fantastic in a lot of ways. Uh, particularly useful so that you don't have to have an outage of your replicas in order to have them repoint to some newly elected primary. Um, so that's something that I'm sure you'll see things like Petroni and the other AJ solutions that exist for Postgres uh, picking up on quite quickly because it's a really important and valuable change. Um, maybe not of interest to everybody, but certainly of interest to, to some people who really care about security, you're now able to control the SSL protocols that Postgres will run as a server with. Um, previously, we didn't have a way of doing this, basically. Um, and in a lot of environments, you're required to disable the older SSL protocols because they're unsafe. So this is a, a important advancement in Postgres. Um, previously, you could enforce it with FIPS mode OpenSSL, which is basically what FIPS mode for OpenSSL did. Um, but that required actually dealing with FIPS mode in OpenSSL at that level. Here we can do it in Postgres, so you don't have to worry about it uh, modifying or monkeying with the system-wide OpenSSL setup. Um, we'll be updating the, the CIS benchmark and the STIG uh, to accommodate this change, of course. PSQL has grown a new output mode. This is a CSV output mode. Um, which basically means that you can have, you can say, do a PSET inside of PSQL and say, give me CSV. So that if you're like in the middle of writing a query, you can just, you know, PSET to CSV, rerun that query, and suddenly you get CSV output, which is nice. I mean, you could previously use copy um, with CSV, but sometimes it's a little bit awkward and you have to actually modify your query and stuff like that. So this does away with all of that. Right, you can just do it directly from inside PSQL, which is awful nice. Um, we also added an option that allows you to sample out the queries that are running in Postgres. So previously in Postgres, uh, you had a, what's called a logmin duration statement, which basically is a way of saying, okay, Postgres, log all the queries that take longer than this amount of time. Now on a very high rate system, if you set that to zero, Postgres slows down. <laughs> right, because everything bottlenecks on trying to write these queries out to the log. Um, now you can actually get away with that if you also configure this log min, um, sorry, the, uh, the log statement sample rate, because you can tell Postgres, okay, only sample queries at, at this rate. And then what will happen is Postgres will give you a, a sampling of queries uh, and have those go into your query log for later analysis. So this is particularly helpful when you have systems that have lots and lots of very short queries, right? That's, that's the big, big place where this is gonna be really advantageous. Uh, because previously, if they were really short, really fast queries, Postgres wouldn't log them. And if you enable logging of them, you would log all of them. And that would slow everything else down. Um, so now we have this ability to do, to do sampling and because we can do sampling, we can then extract out those samples and do further analysis on them. And you can see, like, on an individual query basis, how fast those queries actually work. Is there a question with that? Yeah, is it like uh, 100 queries per minute, or is it like every 10 queries, something like that? How much is actually? Oh, how you configure it? Yes. Uh, I believe it's a percentage basis. Okay. Right, yeah, some kind of percentage basis that you, would, you can tweak and you can adjust. Right, based on what you want to do. Um, that's my recollection. I have to admit, it's brand new in V12 and I haven't played with it very much myself. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's percentage based. Um, so that's kind of wrapping it up in terms of what I had. Yeah, five minutes. So um, 
I did want to make a, a few other comments. So these are kind of features for V12. Uh, looking forward to the future, I talked a little bit about Zheap. I talked a little bit um, about columnar storage. I do think that those are big things that are going to be happening in Postgres uh, moving forward past V12. I think that there's going to be more work going into uh, just-in-time compilation with Postgres. So for those of you who are not aware, Postgres already has the ability to do some just-in-time compilation of parts of a query, right? Actually taking parts of a query and compiling it down into uh, machine code and then running it. Um, that work has kind of gotten backlogged behind the pluggable storage work. But I suspect once we have pluggable storage in V or in V12, I'm really hoping that V13 starts to move things forward more on just-in-time compilation and the, the modifications to our executor uh, that that entails. Because that's going to be a massive win for like analytical queries and things that need to process lots of data. Uh, because eventually we want to get to a point where you can potentially have an entire query that is compiled down to machine code and optimized and then run against the system, um, which can really be a, a massive improvement in, in terms of uh, overall performance. So with that, um, I've got five minutes left, so why don't I, I just wanted to open it up to, to questions. If anybody's got some, I'm uh, happy to entertain pretty much anything. Thank you. I would like to ask about the ecosystem, about the ecosystem is what the company developed. It's so about the important. ecosystem around yes. Postgres? Yes. So I would say the ecosystem around Postgres is really quite positive. Um, we have a lot of different companies. There's really, I would say, three or four major companies that are contributing code to Postgres um, and, and by the form of having uh, one or more full-time staff who are spending time hacking on Postgres. Uh, which I think is, is a really good thing for uh, our community. Um, it's kind of interesting because we're starting to see people buy up Postgres companies. Um, there's been a couple of acquisitions recently. The most recent one uh, that I think people might be aware of is CitusDB, uh, was bought by Microsoft. Um, I don't know that that's gonna change anything right now, but my friends over there have said that things are changing, but they're still very much focused on Postgres. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that it will. That said, uh, CitusDB was an extension. They did their own thing. They didn't really actually, I mean, they did. They contributed some stuff back, but it, it, I don't think it's gonna have a major impact in terms of the overall velocity of the project. Uh, Microsoft has more than once kind of made inroads and, and expressed interest in actually contributing code back to Postgres. Um, they haven't been terribly successful yet. I'm kind of hopeful that they will. Um, because, I, I mean, they certainly have a lot of really smart engineers, and if they can get some people who have some time to work with the community and to help push Postgres forward, that's great. That works for me, right? What about Amazon? No, they should get to their uh, own database based on Postgres. So you're talking about uh, Postgres RDS, or are you talking about Aurora? Uh, I'm not sure. They okay. from Oracle to something uh, related. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, Amazon continues to try to make, you know, continues to spend effort moving off of Oracle. Um, and I think you're going to continue to see that from a lot of big companies. They're not the only ones, right? Salesforce has continued to make massive inroads in terms of moving off of Oracle and moving over to Postgres too. And I think you're just going to continue to see that happening, which from a Postgres perspective, it works for me, right? The more people running Postgres, the better. I mean, I, I work with, you know, a lot of very large multinational companies, helping them with their Postgres strategies and, and getting Postgres deployed into their environments, uh, oftentimes with a kind of end goal of moving off the board. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh -oh, Chris has a question. Uh, oh, I just, I just discovered that there's a Postgres conference next week here in Singapore. Uh, yes, there is. Yeah. I'll be speaking at it. Right, so just like let everybody know. Yeah, so a chance to register for it. Yeah, yeah, you're still uh, there's still off um, seats available. I think both for my training session as well as for uh, the conference itself. The conference is called uh, PG Conf APAC. Uh, starts, I believe, on Tuesday. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, definitely go. Yes. Okay, so um, one thing I saw on the uh, commit fest was a 
patch that was listed as ready for committer involving SSL and um, allowing the option with, say, Scram to require that the C name matches the username. That would allow two-factor two authentication with SSL certs and passwords. Do you know if that's likely to get committed for 12 or get pushed? And I'm not asking for a hard guarantee. I mean, if it's marked ready for committer, that patch, as I recall, was pretty straightforward and relatively small. So I think it probably is going to boil down to if there's any committer who has interest. Um, I can name a few who I think might, and, and we could probably go hound to them. Um, one of them, unfortunately, being myself. So maybe we should <laughs> chat about that. Um, if, it, if it's pretty reasonable and, it, and it's been through firm, you know, enough reviews, I haven't looked at it myself, but okay. that is, that's interesting. I wasn't actually, I hadn't followed that one, so I, I'm curious okay. about it. Any other questions? All right, well, you get a couple minute break from me and then I'm back up here talking about more stuff. <laughs>